Once again, my name is Shannon Sarna. I'm um, editor of The Nosher, part of 70 Faces Media. This class series and the events that we do are part of My Jewish Learning's The Hub. So if you like joining together online, please go to check out The Hub. I'll link it in our chat. We have events going on literally every day and we would love to see you there. It's a wonderful place to learn and see new things and get to hear from people like Jennifer. So, um, if you didn't join us last week, we had we learned how to make um, a traditional Persian chicken stew fezzanun with um, with Jennifer, who is a extremely um, I'm gonna I'm gonna like fuddle up your whole your whole bio, but she is a, a two time right. over a cookbook author, a ex very experienced cooking instructor. She teaches at um, ICE in the city, the JCC of Manhattan. She's so well respected, and we learned so much last week. So I'm going to hand it over to Jennifer. I'm going to ask for a couple of ground rules. Number one is, I know you're going to want to raise your hand to ask a question. Thank you. Put your hand down. You can ask any questions you want in the chat, and I will try to get to as many of them over to Jennifer as possible. I'm looking at all of them. I will do my best. Jennifer's also, she's so experienced. She knows what questions you guys are going to ask. So <laughs> let her talk a little bit and she will, she will get to them um, as well. We're here to learn. We're here to, to hear about the stories and the meaning and technique from Jennifer. So as much as you guys can hold it in, let her teach this recipe. And we'll get to the substitutions. But we're making a recipe tonight that's dairy. It's dairy, guys. It's dairy. We're going to just have to own it <laughs> and, move, and move forward. So if you can right. try to refrain from asking how to substitute not with dairy, maybe this recipe is just not for you. That's OK. We're going to learn here together anyway. So without further ado, thank you so much, Jennifer, for once again being with us. I'm so excited to see these. I wish I was in your kitchen right now. And I will shut up. The chat is open. Ask your questions there. Okay, thank you so much, Shannon, and um, hello, Nasher community. It's so great to be with you again in my kitchen. Um, just wanted to share with you, I'm in New York City right now, um, as we're all virtually from all over the place, just letting you know that I'm in the Upper West Side of Manhattan, for those of you who may be in the city as well. Um, and I just want to give you a little bit of quick, a little more details of my background so you understand uh, my, wh where I'm coming from, what I'm doing, and then we'll get right to the recipes. Um, I'm, I, I'm born, bred, and raised in New York City. Um, I'm half Ashkenazi and half Sephardi, or Mizrahi, depending on how you define it. Um, my background is half uh, coming from Riga and Latvia, and the other side, Syria, so two very different parts of the world. But I actually grew up with all the Syrian traditions um, and foods, cuisine, culture, um, and uh, everything that goes with that. So that's how I got into Middle Eastern cooking. Um, I learned from my great-grandmother and my grandmother, who were both from Syria, from Aleppo, and um, my mother as well. And now I teach not only Syrian cooking in the city, both privately and in, at uh, cooking school, the Institute of Culinary Education, and now, of course, virtually, like so many other people. Um, but I teach uh, Syrian, Lebanese, um, North African, which would be Moroccan, Algerian, Tunisian, Libyan, Egyptian, also Yemenite and Ethiopian I teach, uh, as well as Iraqi and Persian. Um, and some others, but that's just to give you an idea of the countries and the regions that I cover. Um, and I always say in my classes, um, especially when I'm giving a brief, uh, brief introduction like today, um, my interest is not only in sharing great delicious recipes that I love to eat and prepare, but in preserving recipes from being lost in the next generation. That's the most important part um, and the, sort of the motivation that I have for developing and writing these recipes. So after I wrote my first cookbook, A Fistful of Lentils, uh, which I can show you right here, this is um, my family's recipes from Syria. This is my grandmother from Aleppo. And this is just a self-portrait she did because she was a painter. Um, after I wrote this book, um, I started teaching Syrian and every other kind of cuisine in the Middle East. And then I wrote this cookbook, um, some of you might know, Too Good to Pass Over. And this book, Too Good to Pass Over, is a um, compilation of 23 communities in the diaspora of the Middle East, the Mediterranean, and Central Asia, and how each of them, each, because each one has its own chapter, separ um, celebrates Pesach, 
um, the Jewish holiday of Passover, their Seder plate and symbolic foods, their traditions, interviews and me of memories of how it was to prepare um, for Passover in Morocco, India, and so on. Um, and then of course the recipes. Um, so that one took me about 10 years to compile. Um, that's why it's so big. So anyway, these, um, this is just a background of what I do. And so today's recipe is actually one that I often have prepared and also taught in cooking classes that were either for Hanukkah, and you'll see why, because we're frying um, these little fritters, and also there's dairy, which is sometimes an ingredient that's used in uh, Hanukkah, but um, for Shavuot, because Shavuot is often using ingredients also that are dairy. So you can not, you don't necessarily have to prepare it for those two things, but they obviously translate really well for both of those holidays, especially if you're looking for something a little different or to go with your potato latkes or something like that, or another dairy uh, type of dish that's also savory for Shavuot. But if you're not doing for either uh, one of those, you can still prepare it for any other time. I'm going to now just show you my ingredients here, okay? Um, so right here, uh, first I have the ingredients for the um, cheese, spinach trees, uh, cheese fritters. Um, the recipe is called Kefsedes Apospanati, okay? That's the Greek name for it. Um, and uh, Kefsedes, you might have heard the word Kefsedes or Kufta or Kefsedes. These are all similar words, they are related. And it basically refers to something small, usually kind of round, um, that might be uh, shaped into a patty or even a little torpedo shape or even a ball, okay? So it's usually referring to things that are small and round, sometimes baked, sometimes fried. In this case, they're fried. So the ingredients here are basically um, spinach leaves. I'm using base, uh, baby spinach. Um, the herbs are fresh dill and parsley. Um, and then you have a sharp cheese. You can use, um, I'm using Parmesan because that's the one that I was able to get most easily. You basically want a hard, sharp cheese for this kind of recipe. You do not want a soft cheese like a goat cheese or even the feta cheese because when you fry it, it will be a little bit difficult because it will be so soft. This holds together better and melts well together. So you could even do a mix. I even put in, I happen to have a little mild cheddar um, so I mixed it in with my Parmesan, um, but that is fine. You could also even use a hard sh a sheep's or goat's milk cheese if you wanted to do something like that. And then onions. So the, the vegetables or, um, are basically these three things. And then we have salt to bring out the flavor. The eggs are what give it the texture. It brings everything together and binds it all together um, and makes it sort of like a texture that's um, not only a fritter, but could also be depending on how many eggs you put in. You could put more or fewer eggs if you wanted it to be a denser type of fritter or croquette in a way, or if you want it to be more eggy like an omelet and lighter, you can put more eggs. Um, and then the flour is to hold it together more so that it comes like a cake type, type of texture. And then we're gonna use olive oil um, to cook it. And then over here is a short recipe that I like to prepare um, that goes really well with um, this particular dish. And even this, it's called tzatziki. I'm sure many of you have heard this type of dish. It, it is composed of two types of dairy. I have in this one sour cream and the Greek, uh, plain Greek strained yogurt. You can use the 0%, 4%, 2%, whatever percent you want. Um, it is better with a little fat, I will say. So if you don't want to use the, you know, the full fat options of both the sour cream and the uh, yogurt, you can go down to like a 2%. I know sometimes you can get 1.5%, but you will need some of the fat to, to balance the texture and the flavor. And then the flavorings here are um, chopped garlic, uh, again, fresh dill. Dill is very commonly used in uh, Greek cooking. Um, we're going to grate a cucumber and that makes it a nice fresh um, texture and gives it a really nice pretty color, both with the dill, the nice green color, some salt and pepper. And then here I have basically three different um, liquids here that also help in the flavor. Um, I have a little bit of just a simple white vinegar. You can use pretty much any kind of white, white vinegar. The only thing I wouldn't use that's white in terms of vinegar is a white balsamic, because a white balsamic is, even though it's white and not like uh, the red one, it's very sweet. So try to use just a plain, 
simple white vinegar. Then we have a little lemon juice here, and then we have some olive oil. And if you notice, this, these ingredients are kind of interesting. I think a lot of people wouldn't necessarily think of this going into a yogurt-based type of uh, sauce, but it is kind of like a dressing in a sense. And the addition of the lemon juice and the vinegar sort of are the acid that balances the creamy and this, the creaminess and the fat that's in the yogurt. It really makes a difference when you add these two things. And the olive oil does as well. You'll see that it really brings all the flavors together. And I'll show you how to not only prepare it, which is very simple, but how to serve it. Um, and then I'll get into a little bit while we're doing it about similarities in other dishes um, that have in other regions that have and cuisines that make dishes like this. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do, um, and for those of you who are cooking along with me, I'm going to push everything out of the way. And the first thing we want to do is fill, put your spinach in a large pot, and it's going to cook down a lot. So you just need something big enough for all your spinach to fit in. And I'm going to add enough cold water to cover, and we're going to boil our spinach down. Okay, so I'm just filling my pot now with cold water. It, it only has to be enough, you'll see, to just sort of come to the same level maybe as the spinach. It doesn't have to be so much. And I'm going to move it to my um, burner here. Show you what I'm doing, okay? And on high heat, I'm putting on high heat to cook it and bring it to a boil. And what I do recommend you doing is covering your pot, it's not the right cover, covering your pot to, to make it go a little more quickly, okay? Just to bring it to a boil quickly, but it doesn't, it's not necessarily any other reason than um, making it happen faster while we're in class. And the hey, reason hey, I- Jennifer, we do have just a couple of questions I want sure, to- Sure, this is a good before. time for a question, yeah. Um, so one, what, uh, regarding the spinach, how much frozen spinach would you use if you're, if you're not using fresh spinach? <clears throat> ah, okay. So what I would say is now, if you're, the first thing is, if you're using um, frozen spinach, what you should do is first make sure it's defrosted, okay? So if you haven't done that yet, you should put it in your microwave or whatever you can do to defrost it. Once it's defrosted, you do not have to do this step of cooking it because in the process of it being uh, frozen and then defrosting, uh, it kind of breaks down and becomes very soft. And usually the frozen kind is, al is already chopped. So you will not need to do this step to um, cook it down. The reason I cook down the fresh spinach is because if I was to just mix the fresh spinach with all my ingredients, my cheese, my eggs, and so on, um, it wouldn't necessarily cook so well when you're frying it. It wouldn't cook enough. It's good to pre-cook it, get it very soft, and then combine it with all the other ingredients. Otherwise, you'll have like big pieces of spinach sticking out of your, of your fritter. Um, in terms of the amount, what I'm going to have to do is once, um, if you have, let's say, a 10 ounce package, that should be more than enough. Um, and you'll just have to be patient and wait until I'm finished cooking this. And then after I drain it, I will tell you approximately how much of the um, frozen spinach you'll probably need. But I'm guessing that it's going to be about a cup um, without actually measuring it for you. Um, so right now, just defrost it, drain it, and maybe squeeze it dry. Get out all the excess liquid because that's what I'm going to do with this spinach. So that's a good question. Thank you for, and it, this recipe actually translates very well with frozen spinach. If that's something you always have, like I do in my freezer, I always have frozen spinach in my freezer. I'm using it all the time. Um, it's a great go-to um, type of uh, vegetable that is very much, it's used very often in Sephardic cooking um, for all kinds of things. I make all kinds of pies, um, Syrian, even Syrian pies that it might, you might think are Greek, but they're not, they're more Syrian, but they're still Mediterranean, right? Um, and uh, it's good for the fritters and it's good for um, all kinds of other, you know, fillings and, and putting in other types of dishes. Like Does anyone one, else have a like, question? We had one other question. Um, um, yeah. and, you, and we, I use frozen spinach when we make Syrian uh, jibbin, um, which is one of my, my son who's almost two, it's his favorite dish. Oh, you um, mean spanish jibbin? Yeah, spanish jibbin? yeah, yeah. Yes, um, yes that's exactly what I'm talking about. Spanish jibbin, just to um, tell you, because it, it's similar to this. 
This Greek version is the kephedes, right? What I was telling you is the fritter. That's what that means. It's referring to this mixture in the form of a fritter or a little croquette. But the spinach jibin, which is the, the Syrian name, meaning it means literally spinach cheese. Jibin is the Arabic word for cheese. Um, we put this kind of mixture into a baking pan. This is actually, it's really funny you're mentioning this, Shannon, because now I'm just realizing that the Syrian spanak jibin that we make at home, we also serve with a cucumber mint yogurt dressing, mm -hmm. which is a lot like the tzatziki, um, only we add mint and we don't have, we don't add like the vinegar and the lemon juice and all that, but it's the same exact concept. We call it um, leban, which is just the, the white, the yogurt, the dairy. Um, but it's a dish that we use serve cold. We put on rice dishes like rice and lentils and jadra. And we also put it on our spinach jibin, which is the spinach cheese pie without the crust. Uh, it's much like a, an Arabic style frittata. Um, but it's the same concept, right? It's just that one is being baked in a pan and the other one is made into small little uh, sort of portions and fried. So the, the, um, uh, the, the other question was about the garlic, which I think is going into the tzatziki or into, this, or into the keftadis. Yes, so the garlic is going into the um, tzatziki. And actually okay. what we can do right now is we can prepare while we're waiting for the spinach to cook because basically for those of us who are cooking along, you want to be bringing your spinach to a boil. As soon as it comes to a boil, put your timer on five, five minutes, okay? Hamsa, right? Five minutes. All right, so what I'm going to do is bring over my ingredients for the, the tiki. Because and the this, question you know, about the garlic was just um, how, how finely it should be chopped. Should it be pressed or should it be, um, should it be like, you know, grated, like how small? And then one last fine. question. What, okay, very fine. For the, so the person, yes. uh, Steve, Steve asked about the garlic. So it should be, uh, probably you could use a garlic press and that would be great. Um, yes. And then the last question from Margaret is, could, do you think, <laughs> um, I'm sorry, Margaret, I'm not laughing at you. It's just that we always get these questions. Um, do you think that you could make the fritters in an air fryer? So, you know, I haven't had much experience in an air fry with using an air fryer. So I would say you can try it out. And if you've done similar things where you've actually prepared something that has eggs and cheese in it and it works in an air fryer, uh, I'm just not sure how, you know, the air fryer works because I know that, for example, you could make uh, French fries, right? Instead of frying in the oil, you do the air frying with, I think you just put a little bit of oil maybe. Um, and if you're using potato, somebody just posted something about latkes. The only thing I would say is to check and see what happens when you add something that's going to melt. I don't know, so I can't fully answer, but you can certainly try. Um, the other thing is you don't, it's not so much, it's not a donut. We're not deep frying, but we are hand frying. Hand frying is a little different. It's almost like sauteing, but you do want a little bit of oil in there because two reasons. One, you don't want it to stick to your pan. And the other reason is you don't, um, you want it to have a nice kind of browning uh, color on the outside, not only for color, but um, flavor. So it's not quite, it doesn't need maybe as much oil as maybe um, a potato latke because the potato latkes also, those potatoes, uh, usually you're not pre-boiling them or, bake, uh, or baking them or anything like that. So they're grated fine and then you have to cook them. So you need a lot of hot, hot oil to make sure you cook them well, okay? All right, so just to show you what's going on over here on my pot, you see now it's come to a boil and I'm just gonna reduce the heat just slightly but you can see it's boiling. And I'm just cooking it enough until it becomes very soft. And it turns a nice green color too, because that's what the um, boiling does when it cooks the vegetables, it brings out the nice green color. So I'm just cooking it for a few minutes until it gets very soft, and then I'm going to drain it. So what you should have is a mesh strainer. You can either put directly in your sink and then pour this over into this and drain it well, um, or you can put it over a bowl that fits well, 
okay? Maybe this one I can get. You see how much it cooks down? There's very little now. You end up with very, very little, and that's why I wanted to tell you I will measure it the amount after. So actually, I think this small one is gonna be sufficient. So the only reason I'm cooking it just a little bit longer is to make sure that the stems, even though they're very soft and short on the baby spinach, I wanna make sure the stems are kind of soft. I'm just gonna give it another minute or two, and then I'm going to drain it for you, okay? Um, did someone else have a question about the tzatziki or is that, uh, or, or making? Any other question about the pre preparation of the fritter? I think that we no, I think we, we actually got we I think we actually got all of um okay, good. All the questions. But so what but I'm thank you to I, the person who says I'm gonna buy your books, they look great. Oh yes, yes. You should go thank buy Jennifer's you. books. Thank you so much for that. All right, so I'm going to drain this now because it's actually fine. It's pretty soft, so I'm gonna drain it. I think I scared everybody away from asking questions. I'm sorry. Oh no, don't be scared. We got a lot of it's, questions. So, so yeah. now one, one question, um, okay, so we did have a question about substituting flour and I had just sort of shared that you could use an all-purpose gluten-free flour if you can't have gluten. Somebody at, just asked, could chickpea flour be used instead? Um, I, I would know. not use chickpea flour. Okay, what would you suggest? No. Because it's, chickpea flour has a very particular texture and uh, it also has a very, can be, have a strong flavor. So you're gonna start adding things that have a very strong flavor. And I don't think that would go well with spinach and cheese, to be honest with you. Um, I would almost- like a rice maybe, flour? So, okay, so there are two things. One, first I must tell you, I have not done this recipe personally. So that's my disclaimer to using um, a gluten-free option. That being said, Hold on, I'm just straining here. That being said, you wanna make sure you can't, if you do substitute like the white flour, it's not necessarily the exact amount, okay? Because uh, they're not the same ingredients, even though they're called flour. So what I would say is um, try with a little bit, just enough to, to bind it together. And you don't necessarily need so much. And you know, it's possible to even do it without the flour. It will just have a slightly different texture. So I might be inclined to say, just leave it out completely if you really didn't want the flour and you needed to make gluten-free, okay? So that's my suggestion. And then for, just to get back to the spinach here, uh, it came out to about three quarters of a cup. I would say three quarters to a cup, okay? I think I had just a little bit under the um the amount of 10 ounces so i would say if you could get about just a little bit under one cup of um the cho frozen chopped spinach once it's drained then i think you're good okay that's all it is all right so now what we're going to do is we're going to just like we pre-cooked our um spinach we're going to pre-cook our onions um so I'm going to, actually, I'm going to cook this. I'm going to use my um, pot again because I want to use my frying pan for, um, for the frying and it will be clean. So now you're just going to put a high heat again and put about two tablespoons or so into your pot or frying pan, either one. And we're going to cook, we're now going to pre-cook our onions and we want to cook them till they're nice and soft and transparent. Okay, not necessarily brown. Okay, well, that doesn't, we don't need it to be brown, but we definitely want them to be soft and transparent. And the way that you know that you have enough oil, okay, is if you look in the sort of the center of your pot here, and if it's nice and shiny in the middle, nice and glossy and shiny, then it's usually a sign that you have enough oil. You wanna make sure you have enough to really coat all the onions and cook them, okay? And then after it's cooking a little bit over high heat, the onions are going to um, naturally release, release a little bit of uh, liquid, the water that's in there, and, um, and make it soft, okay? So I'm just gonna let that cook there. And now I'm going to bring you back to what I was starting before, which was preparing the tzatziki. So let me just get these ingredients out of the way. And what you should have in front of 
in front of you, like I do, is your yogurt and sour cream or your leban. We're doing a combination of these two things. Um, your salt and pepper, your garlic, your lemon juice, your olive oil, and your vinegar and your dill, okay? So the first thing I'm going to do is just pour into a bowl, and I'm using one that I can cover because it's really best that you can cover it and put it in your fridge and even let it sit overnight or from the morning to the evening so for all the flavors ideally to melt. So this is actually a great dish that's even better when you prepare ahead. So right now, all I'm doing is transferring the Greek yogurt that I have to the, um, to the bowl that I'm going to actually store it in, okay? Um, if you're using Leban um, or a mixture of Leban and Greek yogurt, you would put that into the bowl right now, okay? And that would be your total of two cups if you're doing the full recipe. And then I'm adding, I like to cut it with a little bit of sour cream. Sour cream is sort of, to me, like the American version of a Greek yogurt or Leban. It has, or, or the creme fraiche, you know, the French uh, type of dairy yogurt type of, or cream that has a little bit of a sour flavor to it. And then I'm just combining that and mixing that together. And also, don't forget, you have your onions going on here, right? So just give it a little bit of a mix. If you start to see your onions browning a little bit, I'm gonna add a little more oil. I, I can see that it's a little bit dry, okay? If it's starting to brown a little bit after you mix it, you can also reduce to slightly to a medium heat. Once it gets very hot, you don't need to have it so high anymore. But you don't want it too low because you really need to cook it so it's soft, all right? All right, so now coming back to here, I've had added the two, uh, the yogurt and sour cream. And then you can really just add whatever ingredients you want next. I'm adding my chopped garlic, and you do want finely chopped. The reason you don't want, you want to be careful that the pieces are not too big is anyone who's going to eat this yogurt, um, this sauce, you don't want them to be eating and, and into big pieces of garlic. And that's the part that actually takes time to break down into the sauce. And you'll find the next day or two, especially if you don't eat it today or if you have leftovers, it will taste much better tomorrow because the, the garlic will break down. And then you can Jennifer, add your salt. You, um, Jennifer, yeah? could you just speak to what, um, you know, what you're talking about with Leban? So we have a qu question about what is it exactly? Is it Labna? Is it Greek yogurt? Labna. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So Labna, Labna is now if you've been to Israel or the Middle East, you've probably had it or in a Middle Eastern restaurant. It's a strained, it's a Middle Eastern style strained yogurt, much like the um, Greek kind because the Greek, they're not the only ones that strain yogurt. That's a very ancient process. Uh, yogurt itself is an ancient food. Um, and so straining it is what thickens it. It takes out the excess liquid, the water, and then you end up with something that's almost more what we call a Middle Eastern style cheese, right? It's a soft kind of cheese. It's almost eaten like that. Uh, you've probably eaten it where you eat it with like bread, like a dip or something like that. The difference between labna and a Greek strained yogurt, all you have to do is taste them side by side and you'll know the difference. Um, the texture of the Greek yogurt is, uh, they're both of them are very thick, but the labna is very sour. It has a tart flavor, which I love. I love yogurt that has a tart, sour flavor. That's the cultures that are in the dairy. Um, and I find the Greek one is a little bit more bland and not at all sour. Uh, so I like to mix in the sour cream or the labna because I like that tanginess, that sourness. But sometimes the labna is almost too rich, um, too thick. So that's why I like to cut it with a little bit of yogurt. So, yeah, so thank you for that question there. Okay, my onions are getting there. They're not quite where I want them to be, but they're definitely close. Okay, they're turning a little yellow, which is good, but they still look to me a little bit sharp around the edges, right? So I'm gonna let it cook just a few more minutes and let, let me just finish putting together this labna or this um, tzatziki rather. So now I'm putting in my chopped dill, okay? And that too you wanna have pretty fine um, because you, you don't want big pieces, right? This is not gonna be cooked. You always have to imagine how your dish is going to be consumed and served and eaten, okay? So you can see that you have nice specks of green in there. 
I'm just going to put in just a little bit of pepper, a little bit of black pepper there, not too much for flavor. And then it doesn't matter what order you put it in, but you pour in your lemon juice, your vinegar, and lastly, your olive oil. Okay? So this is going to bring the texture together. Yes? Could you talk about the vinegar one more time? Somebody had a question about which vinegar they could or couldn't use. Okay, so you want to put in white vinegar. It can be pretty much any type of white vinegar and a lemon juice, those two for flavor. And again, the lemon juice and the vinegar are both acidic, so they'll give it tanginess, but they'll also break down the fat um, in your uh, yogurt. And um, the olive oil helps to make it less sharp um, in terms of um, the yogurt too, because the yogurt can be a little bit thick and rich um, and makes it softer. I don't know how else to describe it, it's softer on your palate. Um, I wouldn't use a red wine vinegar of any sort, and I would not use um, a uh, white wine uh, balsamic, white balsamic, because it's very sweet, okay? All right, everybody should turn off. I think the onion should be fine now, okay? So what I'm going to do is now pour my onions into my spinach mixture, okay? So that now the onions and the spinach are in my mixing bowl for the batter to make the cassettes, okay? So I'm just doing that. And then you can just put your pot aside. But now you have your, um, your mixture of strained uh, spinach, okay, with the cooked onions, okay? And it should smell already really good. You don't have to work too hard to make your kitchen smell great already, okay? So now I'm just breaking up the spinach and mixing it in with my um, spinach here. And you know, you could use other kinds of onions too. If you have scallions, you could put some scallions, some onions. Um, you know, the green onions or scallions are great too in something like this. And in fact, the Greeks have um, a version where they make with leeks, especially for Pesach. Um, they make a leek type of uh, croquette that's very, very popular. Um, and is in similar type of thing, but not necessarily. Sometimes it has meat in it, and sometimes it's just vegetarian without any dairy. Okay, so now I have in here, I have my um, spinach and I have my onions, and I'm going to put in my dill, all right? Mix that in there. Lots of nice, fresh dill. Put in my parsley, okay? mixture nice and green it's also a great spring kind of dish too because of all the herbs and the color of green you know and that's why also uh, the Greeks will not only for Passover but because Passover is in the spring herbs are used often right to celebrate spring and and that's why it's also made for Pesach and then here I'm going to add my salt make sure that's distributed well um, and then probably what I have left here are the eggs, the cheese, and the flour. So what I'm going to do is add my, um, my eggs first. The only thing I want to do is before I finish this, because I really want to get the tzatziki done so it's sitting a little bit of time for those who are making it now. The last ingredient before we took the uh, onions out is the cucumber. And I like to use a Persian cucumber or Israeli, sometimes they call it, they're thin and they're very crispy and they don't have many seeds in them um, and they don't have a lot of excess water. So that's why I use these all the time now for everything. Um, what I like to do is grate it. You might wanna grate it over a bowl, okay? Doesn't matter what bowl, I use this for the dill, so I'm gonna reuse it. And you wanna grate it on the largest grating side. Okay. And you're going to squeeze it dry. That's why I'm doing it on a bowl because I'm going to squeeze it dry before I add it to my yogurt. Again, because you don't want excess liquid in there. It waters down your yogurt. Okay, so just be careful of your knuckles and your fingers when you're going in there. Okay. 
All right. Access that fell out. And then you just take, and this adds also, a, really makes it very fresh tasting. You see I'm squeezing out the excess liquid here. See, there's the water in there. Just put that into your yogurt. You don't need that. Just put that in there. These are all little tips that are very simple, but actually make a big difference. And I do this also when I'm making my Levon, the Syrian one, with the mint and the yogurt. I do the same technique and I use the same kind of cucumbers because I think they work the best. So then you just mix that all together so it's well blended. Okay. And as soon as it's well blended, that's it. That's all you have to do until you're ready to serve, okay? And you can taste to adjust for salt, but what I would do is wait until it's been sitting a little bit before I would adjust it, okay? So now I'm just gonna cover it and put it to the side and we'll get to it when I show you how to serve everything. All right, so now I'm back to finishing my Gifta this mixture and also it was good that we finished the other thing because it gave a little time for the onions and the spinach to cool down and not be so hot before we add the um, eggs and the cheese, okay? So, Okay, I'm just gonna bring over what I call, we call a garbage bowl, just to get rid of the shells on the side. And then you can add all your eggs. We have a good number of eggs here, right? Um, now, if you wanted to use just, you know, maybe six eggs and not so many eggs, that's okay. You know, it's okay if you're not using exactly the amount of eggs. You can use, the more eggs you use, um, the lighter, the uh, dish is going to be. And actually, dishes like this, like we have something in Syrian cooking, um, we don't call, uh, it, when we make the little fritters um, with eggs, we call it a Eje is like a little uh, fritter. The most common one is made with meat, actually. It's called eje, and it's a spiced meat uh, with onions. But we also make with all kinds of vegetables, um, and we just call different kinds of uh, like badonas, which would be with the parsley, um, it's sort of a parsley croquette or fritter. And my grandmother would always say, you know, you add as many eggs as you want to stretch it, right? So if you want to make a dish, we also make with tuna, like fish. Um, if you want to stretch the meal a little bit, um, you just add more eggs and you end up with more of these aja or these keftedes. So, um, the balance of eggs also will determine how many uh, you can make. And you can see it's pretty thin, liquidy. That's why you need to add the cheese. And then when you're done with that, you can add your, um, your flour. So now I'm going to add the cheese, the grated cheese. That's a lot of cheese. Yeah, it's a lot of cheese. If you wanted the proportion to be less cheese for this amount, you can do that too. Whoever said less, whoever said, mm, you know what? Less cheese would be better. No, that looks great. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. There's not too big either. When you make these, they're, they're, they don't come out to be too large. You know, they're small. You're meant to have maybe like a serving of three at a time. And then with something else, it could be a meal, but it could also be an appetizer. It can be served with a salad. It can be served with other things. Right, but um, now you see if you're not, for those of you who are not adding flour, this is the texture, okay? And so you could cook this and it would be more like the aja I was telling you about, the Syrian kind, which is more eggy and more soft. And then you add the flour in this version, which makes it a little more cakey, you know, in texture. So I would say that you can experiment and try both ways if you wanted. You could divide, divide the batter and, um, and you could decide which one you prefer, you know? And do half the amount of flour in the final amount, okay? So now I'm just gonna make sure I incorporate everything really well. And then once that's done, 
we're going to start with the frying. Okay. Now you see it kind of it soaked up all that extra. The eggs soaked up all the flour, and now you've got your batter. All right, so now I'm going to bring you over, clean my space a little bit. I'm going to bring you over to my skillet, my clean skillet, and I'm going to fill it up with some oil. In fact, what I'm going to do. Yeah, I guess I'll cook more than I thought. You should get, those of you who are cooking with me, you should get a table, measuring tablespoon ready because that's how you're gonna measure your amount. You should get your skillet and you should also have next to the skillet a frying, um, a plate lined with a uh, paper towel, okay? So that as you fry, you can put them on there to absorb the oil and get them away from the heat, okay? So now you want high heat. All right, I have my batter here. <clears throat> and then you wanna put in your oil. You wanna make sure the bottom is coated pretty well, all right? And you know, it also seasons the, the pan. You know how like when you make pancakes, the first might not work out as well, and then it gets just to the perfect temperature, the oil, the pan, everything. So you want a good, you want a good film there at the bottom of your pan. Don't be too, don't put too little. Okay, um, and now once it's hot enough, and the way you know when you're frying something's hot enough, like if you're doing latkes, is you put a little bit, a tiny amount of that or a piece of bread or something in there to see if it fries. If it starts to sizzle immediately, that's how you know that the oil is hot enough. If you start to put everything in your pan right away and it doesn't sizzle, um, the problem with that is it will come to temperature eventually, but that's the, the issue with um, your, your ingredients that you put in there will start to absorb all the oil that's in the pan instead of frying in the oil. So that's why it's really important that you make sure your oil gets nice and hot uh, before you add anything. So that's just what I'm waiting for right now. And then as soon as we get to that point, I'm going to add and put in some serving. And basically you can decide how big, but I wouldn't make it too big. Um, I generally find that one level or one full tablespoon um, is more than enough for the size um, that you know you're trying to make. Okay, and then you'll cook it about one, one and a half minutes on either side. Okay, so I'm going to test it now a little bit. Just see. Oh yeah, and it's frying. And see it's frying right away. It still needs to get a little hot, but I think we can start. So now you take about a tablespoon, nice round, what we call this is rounded, rounded tablespoon. And I use my measuring spoon because then it, it helps me to make sure that I don't start making them too big. Because it also, it's important not only for cooking time, but also so that when you serve, they serve it, they look nice. They look sort of uniform. Okay, so I use this also for cookies. I use a measuring spoon to measure out my cookies. And you don't want to drop it. If you drop it from too high, you'll splatter yourself and you'll burn yourself. So make sure you get close. And you see it's more than enough for a serving to do one rounded tablespoon. And make sure you give enough room in between so that you can get in there with the spatula to get them out. Okay? And so we're going to cook them in the oil and you wait first until they get nice and brown around the edges and then we'll flip them over. And so you ha should have a nice thin, I like these thin rub plastic uh, spatulas because it gets under things very easily. Um, and then what you want to also have is maybe a fork to help you get it onto your spatula. That's one thing I kind of learned on my own that helps instead of trying to chase it around the pan to pick it up, is to get it on um, onto the spatula. So while I'm frying here, does anyone, this is a good moment for questions. Anybody have any questions about it? I'm just, for those of you who are not cooking, it, it has a very nice smell. It definitely smells a little like Hanukkah, I have to say. 
Okay, you see how this nice golden color, just like a latte is coming? That's what you want. You see, yeah, that's one, that one's even better. Sort of a reddish uh, brown color. I have to say that these look so delicious. I have to make this for my family. They look yes. amazing. They are good. And they're, they're a good crowd pleaser, I have to say. I know people, not everyone likes frying foods or eating fried foods, but then once they're you know, sort of cooled or even at room temperature, they're still good. They reheat really well. Um, oh, we got a lot of questions. Them. Okay, let's hear them. Oh my gosh. All right. Number one from Eileen, what kind of oil do you recommend for this? Well, you can use a, a vegetable, canola, sunflower, or you can use olive oil because, um, and if you don't want to use olive oil, you can use, or you want to use olive oil, but you don't want to use one that's extra virgin, you can use um, one that's not. But you can use vegetable oil, that's fine. I'm actually using an olive oil. Because um, it's, not, it's not too, even though I'm frying, I'm not frying it too high, like a donut. So it, it works pretty well. And you see how quickly it's working. And they puff up a little bit. And that's from both the eggs and the flour. Okay, just to show you what one looks like. See? So people seem to that, think that they look a little, a little flattened looking. You don't like, you don't press them down, right? I did not press it down. It's just when I turned it over, it flattened the rounded side that was on okay. top. But I'm not pressing it to get it thin. But it, it does, it does puff up. It's hard, maybe it's hard to see, but it's not too thin. It kind of puffs up a little bit. Um, I'm so about, jealous. About I wish I was eating thick. those. Um, Donna wants to know how long will the tzatziki keep in the fridge? Oh, I would say like four or five days. And then the next question, one of our favorite questions, Joanne wants to know, can you make these a day ahead of time and reheat them? And I'm going to anticipate the next question. How would you recommend reheating them? So um, you can definitely make them ahead and reheat them. Um, as it is with all fried foods, um, they won't be crispy the next day. Once you put them in a the container, they will no longer be crispy, but that doesn't mean they won't be good. So that's the first thing. You can reheat them in the microwave. If you want a little more crispiness uh, brought back, you can heat them on a baking sheet. You can put it on like a lightly greased baking sheet and reheat them at about 250, 300 degrees just until they're hot. Okay. Our next question um, from Eva, which you talked a little bit about before, but maybe you could just repeat it. Could you use less eggs than you used earlier? Yeah, you can use less eggs. Um, but just remember, if you use less eggs, um, you, want, you might want to cut down on the flour too. So if you wanted to, um, once you, uh, what I would do is put it, mix in the flour and the eggs last, combine all the ingredients that you have, you know, all the other ingredients first, and then add, you know, if you're not sure how many eggs you want to add, then instead of, what did I say, eight eggs, um, go with four and see what four or five eggs uh, give you in terms of texture. But you don't want, you want to build on it so that it doesn't get too, either too liquidy or too uh, thick, right? So that's why I say you should make sure that you, um, you also compensate if you're adding less, uh, eggs, fewer eggs, you have to add less flour. You're going to end up with something that's way too dry. So here's my question. I'm curious because we always make latkes actually during Passover. Um, huh. This recipe uses a lot of flour. I'm not sure. Could you substitute matzo meal? Like, could you make these kosher for Passover? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you yeah. could. That's the okay. Jewish breadcrumb. Yes, you could do that. Um, I feel like these would be so yummy on Passover. Yes, and like I was saying, on Passover... There are versions of this kind of a thing that the Greeks do, uh, the Sephardic Greeks uh, make for Pesach with leeks. Ah, right, right. Well, um, and, they, and they do not put flour in it. Some put in a little matzo meal and some don't if you want it more just sort of uh, basic and um, like the potato latke, right, with no, no flour of any sort. So um, yes, you can do it. 
it would just be the version that they do during Pesach. I'm just taking out the very the nicely cooked ones that are nice and brown. You really want to make sure you cook them enough, right? Don't take them out. Sometimes people, I notice, they get a little nervous and take them out too soon. Um, you really want to wait until you get a nice reddish brown tone on both sides, okay? It tastes much better, and also it cooks everything better inside. Um, the other thing I want to point out, and this is true for anything when you're frying, like this kind of thing and the latkes you might know, is that if you start to see it smoking, that means you have to bring your temperature down. So always be vigilant and watching the temperature and adjusting up and down, up and down. Uh, if it's dry, you can add a little oil. If it's, the pan starts to get a little bit dry. And if you end up, you think, burning your oil, then just pour it out, clean out your pan, and put in fresh oil. Okay, but you do have to make sure that you don't uh, burn your oil or you'll get like a burnt flavor and it's not so great, okay? Any more questions? I like these questions. So I'm just gonna keep frying and then what I'm going to do is quickly show you, you know, just how to bring it all together and serve it. After I make this, this round, I think I'll do that because we have enough to put out on a, on a nice serving platter. So we're all invited over after this, right? To oh, yeah. Oh, Great. yeah. They're nice and hot. It's perfect. Yeah, and I'm on a medium heat now. I went from high to medium to get it where we are now. Because once the oil gets really hot, the pan gets really hot, then you can bring the temperature down. Okay, so I'm going to start getting my um, one possibility of a serving um, platter ready. And a little bit of a bowl here. In my bowl. And I'm going to show you one, op one possibility of how to serve. So this is what they look like when they're on the platter, fresh off the pan out of the pan keep my eye on what's in there still okay and then we have our tzatziki so you want to serve that in a nice decorative bowl if you have something like that something that looks nice so i put it in a little bowl like that i like to collect now different kinds of serving platters and bowls and a lot of eastern cooking actually doesn't use a lot of bowls it uses a lot of platters or a mix of platters and bowls okay I know that Americans tend to put everything in bowls, but we like to put some things on platters too. All right, so wait, I'm just gonna turn over the latkes that are gonna overcook in my pan here, so not to forget, okay? All right, so then what I like to do is take my fritters and just kind of you know, overlap them so they look nice. You wanna make sure that your platter looks full right? So it looks full. The people like it when it looks like a full plate of food. Okay, so this is just like one way you can do it. If you had a larger platter, you can put more. Um, I've also done it where I had a circular platter and I would do it in a spiral, but I like to overlap them because I think it shows, it, it just looks a little nicer than just putting them flat and spread out. Um, and then I'm trying to find herbs to put on there. If you have, bear with me for one second here. If you have some parsley, or even if you have coriander leaves or something, it's something green looks nice to kind of sprinkle on top there, just to make it look a little more finished. If you had extra dill, um, I recommend doing that because there's already dill in the uh, fritters. So I'm just gonna take these out now. And also, you can put some, you know, in your, um, in your tzatziki. There you go. Is your keftedas apospanaki. So how many of you who are cooking, I just wonder how you're doing in there. Yeah. If anybody's cooking, you can show them, you can show them, hold them up. 
Yeah, let's see it. Um, we did have a couple of questions that came in. First of all, mm -hmm. a couple of people were asking about Jennifer's books, so I added them into the chat once again. You can find them on Amazon. Um, I'm just going back here for some of the questions. Um, uh, Phyllis is concerned if the fritters are cooked on the outside, is all of the egg on the inside um, cooked? Yes. And also approximately how much, how many um, fritters does this make? Last question from Jill. If she omits the onions, do you think she needs more flour to hold the mixture together? Oh, okay. So let me try to remember those questions. I'll go back. Um, I'm sorry. So the first question was about cook, uh, making sure the eggs are cooked through. Yes. Uh, so if you've ever, you know, when you make eggs and omelets, eggs and omelets, they cook very quickly. Eggs cook very, very quickly. Um, so especially you've already pre-cooked the onions, you've already pre-cooked the spinach, even if it was frozen, it's basically um, ready to eat. And once you put it in the pan, everything comes together and it's the hot oil, because also they're not very, very thick, um, the very hot oil cooks it very quickly. Um, and when you flip it over, it's more than enough once, especially once it's browned, to cook your, um, the, the egg. So you wouldn't worry about that. And especially if you can pick it up like this, it's basically like an, a little mini omelet. You know, it may not be the kind that you're thinking of where you flop it over, right, and stuff it, but that's what an omelet is. It's just like a little, like, cooked frittata. It's like a mini frittata. So it's definitely cooked enough. Um, the other question was if you leave out something. If you leave out the onions, do you need more flour to hold it together? Oh, uh, no, you probably have enough. But I, if you're going to leave out, there's a lot of onions in this that really adds to the flavor. Um, otherwise, you just have the herbs. And onions are used a lot because they're, they add so much flavor. So if you don't put any onions in there for whatever reason, if you can still add some kind of something in the onion family like scallions, that would be, that would be helpful. Um, you may not need as many of them because scallions are, have a different kind of flavor. But you, I would recommend having something like that. And if you really can't have anything in the onion family, you can leave it out um, and then uh, just have the herbs, you know, um, the herbs. Maybe just supplement with, uh, you could add a little more parsley, a little more greens, um, which is a vegetable, right, and has water in it when it cooks a little bit, maybe a little more spinach to make up for the onions, because that has liquid in it too. It's a vegetable, so you want to fill it up with something. So I would say a little more uh, actually spinach and herbs to compensate. Two more questions. Uh, this was from earlier, we didn't get to it, but of course it's our favorite question. We can't have a Jewish mm -hmm. cooking class without it. Does it freeze well? Yes, these freeze well, um, but what you should do is make sure they're cooled completely before you freeze them. And then when you're ready to freeze them, um, you can, uh, ideally it, it would be great if you can put it in between layers of like parchment paper or wax paper when you freeze them in a, like a airtight container. If you don't have room for that, um, I've done it where I've even, once it's cool, I've put it in a Ziploc bag. I mean, I even have done it that way, whether it's like portioned, portioned out into small little baggies so that you can just take it out and defrost that amount um, and you have it for dinner or lunch or whatever. Um, but these things do freeze well, yes. And then you'll just defrost them and then reheat them as you would, uh, you know, normally. About how many fritters does this recipe make? It actually makes a lot. It makes about three, three dozen. So That's you could lot, even yeah. do half a recipe if you didn't want to do so many. Um, if one and a half dozen is more than enough for you, one and a half to two dozen, basically, if you have the recipe, that's fine. You could make them a little bit larger if you wanted to, but I think this size, you know, is actually a good size. It's a good portion size so that you can eat like three and feel satisfied. Um, you can also eat this, you know, like a sandwich. It can be on a platter with a salad, but it can also go in like a pita. You know, you can eat it in, in many different ways, like a vegetarian mm. um, sandwich with pita and a little bit of the tzatziki dressing and maybe add some tomatoes and um, cucumbers or lettuce, right? So you almost have like a, an Eastern Mediterranean style sandwich and a pita, sort of a mixture of different cultures. But I think that would work really well. 
That sounds um, like a great idea. Yeah, it's a great way to have a vegetarian kind of uh, meal, right? Um, well, we are just at 8.30. If there's any okay, last great. pressing questions that are not substitution questions, guys, um, then let's, uh, we're happy to, to keep Jennifer for just another minute for any questions. But yeah. um, I just want to thank everybody for joining us again and remind you that next week is going to be our third and last installment, our last for now with Jennifer um, class. And, and it's going to be cookies and tea. We're going to be making flourless Syrian pistachio cookies, right, Jennifer? Oh, yes. For all of you who don't want the flour, I highly recommend that you come next week because I'll be making my Syrian pistachio macaroons, which are flourless, and they have orange blossom water in it, so it's very nice because mm -hmm. it's a little bit different, very Eastern in flavor. And we'll also be doing a Moroccan, a fresh Moroccan-style sweetened mint tea. Um, so it's a great way to finish off the series with a little bit of a sweet and dessert. And I, Shannon, I also wanted to mention too, um, if you're interested, please uh, email me or sign up through my website for my ongoing uh, virtual cooking lessons that I give. Um, I have one coming up next week on the 22nd, which is in the same vein as Greek cooking today, where I'm making a Greek uh, rice with feta, tomatoes, and spinach. So if you're interested on the 22nd, I'm doing that one in the evening. Um, and then you can sign up and then receive my newsletter that will, uh, as I schedule classes that are open to the public, uh, you can just do like a drop in class and sign up for and register for one of my classes. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, and will you just mention the names of your books one more time? I've linked them a couple of times. Yes. Um, and tell me the name of your website and I'll link it right here in the chat as well. So my website is just my name, Jennifer Abadi, A B A D I dot com. And um, it should be in your recipe packet as well. And my Passover cookbook is too good to pass over. So it's not just for Passover, except for a few matzo recipes. Most of it is just special holiday cooking. And a fistful of lentils is my Syrian Jewish cookbook. So this is so great. I, I just, this was so wonderful to watch. I love um, having the opportunity to learn with you and I know everybody else is as well. So Jennifer, thank you again so much. Um, everyone else, we will see you next week. Yes, we will share the recording and i um, looking forward to seeing your faces again and all your questions next week. Thank you guys so much for joining. Great. Thank you, Shannon. And good night, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. I look forward to seeing you next week.